So there, there is a drug out there called Ozempic, which was used to treat people with type 2 diabetes. And the observation was, wow, it's reducing their glucose levels. So their hemoglobin A1C is coming down, but they're losing weight. So then they decided to do a study and see what if we gave the drug at slightly different doses, we'll call it a new name. We'll call it Wagovi instead of Ozempic, but same drug. And can we just give it to people without diabetes and see if they lose weight? And the answer was they do, they lose a lot of weight. And so in about 2020, that paper was published and that led to what we've seen now, which is a pretty significant adoption of the use of that class of drug for weight loss in people without diabetes. The reason it probably leads to so much weight loss is it's a really um, significant appetite suppressant. So I've heard you talk about this subject and anytime Lauren and I have dealt here, this is like, for whatever reason, this is like a sensitive subject now to a lot of people because I think so many people have seen maybe what they deem as success from a weight loss journey on this stuff. Um, obviously there's a real application for it for people that need the medication for diabetes. Um, what we've said, not being experts is, th is that you got to maybe be careful with this stuff. If you weren't somebody who's necessarily needing it from a metabolic or from a medical standpoint, because to your point, it suppresses appetite. But I tell me if I'm wrong here. I thought I heard you mention one time that some of the things you had seen or some of the data, or maybe even some of the patients was that the weight loss of muscle compared to fat was outweighing what a healthy weight loss journey should look like. Meaning, I think you said like normal weight loss is a fourth muscle and three fourths fat. And then, and tell me if I'm wrong here. No, you're, you're hundred percent right. And unhealthy weight loss is maybe two thirds muscle, one third fat. And that's what you were seeing in some people or some studies. But you also, when you're talking to me, there's a little bit of a, to me and tell me an undertone of like an indifference. Like I, I can almost see that you, it seems like it's per case. Yeah. Everything is, everything is. So to follow up on your point, um, you know, we were very early adopters of the use of semaglutide in our practice. Um, our, the first time we gave it, and, and by the way, I'd prescribed liraglutide to patients as early as 2014. Um, the effects were modest, but better than other traditional appetite suppressants out there. Um, and appetite suppressants have a long and sordid past within medicine. Sure. Um, so we, I mean, there's a, we could spend a whole podcast just talking about the science of appetite suppression and the risks that have been often found with some of these drugs. But there was something different about semaglutide. It was truly the first of these drugs that didn't, at the, on its face, appear to have catastrophic consequences and had remarkable efficacy. So two things. It really, really worked, and it didn't seem dangerous, at least in the short term. That was a big deal. Um, so... You're right in that we think ideal weight loss is probably about 25% lean, 75% fat, or better. If you can do 90, 10, you know, that's even better than 75. But 50-50 but is not so great. You unless, just don't want lean outweighing the... Not even that. I want fat to be at least three times the lean. Okay. Now, again, if a person is morbidly obese and has plenty of lean mass and plenty of fat mass, you'd probably tolerate a higher amount. Um, but the first thing we started noticing in patients on semaglutide was they were losing a lot of weight, but like half of it was muscle. So yeah, a person lost 20 pounds, but they lost 10 pounds of muscle and 10 pounds of fat. And, um, I don't have a great answer as to why other than the appetite suppression seemed so profound that these patients had a hard time eating protein. Protein is a particularly satiating macronutrient. And so if you're not hungry at all, the last thing you want to do is force feed yourself protein. And we saw some other really negative things that again, I don't want to generalize, so I can only tell you what I saw in our patients, but we saw a lot of people drinking their way through semaglutide. With alcohol? Or yeah. Alcohol. Okay. Yeah. So they would just, they would sort of like, because let's be honest, like even if your appetite is suppressed, you're still pretty good having a margarita. 
you don't want to have a, a, a salad and a chicken breast, but you could probably down a couple margaritas if you're not, if you're feeling a bit nauseous. And so we would see these patients and they're losing weight, but they're, they're actually doing a transition of calories to alcohol. Hmm. So they're, again, the scale looks better, but they're not getting healthier. Or maybe even in some cases they're feeling more confident. They're going out more. They're being more social. Sure. There's lots of potential reasons. So I think this just made us think even more and more critically about risk versus reward. And to your point, like there are absolutely people who benefit so much from this drug. Sure. That's now we don't really use it anymore. Truthfully, we use a newer drug called terzepatide. Um, Monjaro is the uh, trade name of it, but terzepatide is People's a- keyboards are on fire right yeah, now looking this up. It's, it's actually a much better drug because it is both GLP-1 and another hormone GIP, and it seems to produce better results and fewer side effects. And fewer side effects mean people can continue to sort of eat reasonably, meaning eat more protein. So um, I, I think we probably are- weaning any patients that we have on semaglutide and putting them on terzepatide. Um, and again, like if you're a patient who's really metabolically ill or really overweight and you've tried all these other things, I think these are, I think these are reasonable options, but I do, I do worry when I see people who are showing up to our practice who say, I'm, I got a wedding in six weeks. I got to lose 10 pounds like put me on this drug. I, I was going to ask you from your perspective, and I guess maybe for people that don't have access to someone like yourself that are just kind of, because we know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are doing this stuff now. It's, it's become very popular. What are the, wor what are the long-term worries that you have? And this could just be a generalization. Like if somebody is maybe not a, a pure health candidate that's doing it because they want to tighten up that 10 pounds or 20, like what do you see as the long-term risk? That's part of the problem, Michael. I don't think we know. You know, I, I think, and that's the problem I have with really being able to tell my patients, like, this is a lifelong strategy. And that's what I say to patients as well. I'm like, look, I think there's probably a net benefit to you doing this in the short term. So let's give it a shot. Short term meaning? Let's, let's do this for a year. Oh, so basic. That's, that's, well, I mean, that's not like, it's not, you're not saying a month. No, but I, I think what I'm limited by is the duration of the studies right? Like, you know, we've seen patients on these drugs for a year, for two years, and then follow them for another couple of years. And I say to patients, if, because the real question is, let's just say it's a significant weight loss. So let's say it's a person who's got to lose 50 pounds. You know, they're starting at 275. You're going to get them down to 225. What's the probability that you're going to lose that weight in a year? It's really high you're going to succeed. The real question is, what's the probability you're going to stay at that low weight when you stop the drug in a year? Have you seen anything after that it, people do stay at it or have you seen the opposite? Most people regain, it depends, anywhere from all of it to half of it. But we've seen some other weird things that definitely give us a bit of pause. We've seen patients that have enormous cravings that come back after. Um, so, so there's another, there's a whole science here that's really just being explored. Um, Andrew Huberman and I, and I are going to be doing a podcast on this in a few weeks where we are going to look at the effect of GLP-1 inhibition on cravings because there was a really interesting article that came out by one of the three scientists who discovered GLP-1. There were three scientists who discovered this hormone many years ago. And one of them came out with a piece six months ago that said, there's a real risk that people that go on these drugs are going to lose pleasure in food indefinitely. Like they're going to completely lose the ability to find pleasure in food. And so some people get more cravings and some people get less pleasure in food after they come off of it. No, the, the people on it will lose cravings in food, but that might be a permanent problem. And then there's these other people who have a suppression of cravings that completely explodes wow. when they are off the drug. So it could go either way. Yeah. Basically, the point is, at least to me, there's a whole lot we don't understand yet. And when you're dealing with uncertainty, you just have to, I think, 
decide, is this really worth the risk? Am I better off tr trying harder on these other ways to lose weight and improve my metabolic health? Or do I really have to, you know, take this chance and realize that, hey, in a year I might be sitting here saying, well, am I going to stay on this or am I going to go off it? 